Once upon a time, and tell me, how else could I start a story of Margaret's life? A daughter was born to a couple living in Fokatani. She was a primary school teacher. He, somewhat older, a builder of bridges. There was poetry in this family, a Celtic heritage. Her grandfather wrote the infant Margaret a letter, beginning, I am informed that you happily arrived this afternoon, quite punctually after a long journey. <laughs> Finishing with, so Margaret may arrive today, not unannounced, they seem to say. She brought no luggage, but came to stay. A doctor went along to greet her. A kind nurse, too, was there to treat her. Of course, her mother went to meet her. Important Margaret May. By the time another four children had arrived, Margaret was a solid, fair, and articulate schoolgirl. A fast and greedy reader, that's how she described herself. And as soon as she could form the words on paper, a writer of her own stories and poems. Her very first, Harry is Bad, pencil written age seven in a small exercise book, still exists. Others were published in the children's pages of the Bay of Plenty Beacon. She was soon winning competitions. That proves it, she thought, seeing her name and work in print. I really am going to be a writer. In her house, there was music round the piano. Stories were daily read aloud. She recognized early that she best liked tales about people in states of extremity, facing death and danger, but in the process of escaping with courage and good luck, able to transcend themselves. Her father read her King Solomon's Minds when she was only seven, took her to movies of The Jungle Book and The Wild West, and taught her music hall ballads, though she never learned to sing in tune. At primary school, she was, well, different. Clumsy and often lonely, poor at maths, a puzzlement to fellow pupils and teachers, yet overly talkative to the point of being occasionally strapped. She drank out of puddles like Mowgli, and for a birthday party, her mother told her that she had the right face to go with the witch costume. <laughs> she became a good swimmer. Around 10, she bought herself a telescope. She took herself around Fokatani's churches, eager to find out what different denominations she had to offer, they had to offer, but decided at that stage she was probably agnostic. By the time she got to high school, she was seen as a bit of a rebel, a tomboy. Lucky in her choice of parents, Margaret was equally lucky at high school. A perceptive English teacher, Ian McLean, insisted that, although she'd been in low ability classes at primary school, she should be put in the top stream. He introduced her to the canon of English literature, classical music, Gilbert and Sullivan, and actively encouraged her own writing. Some poems survive from her high school days, including the one called Ghosts, and they're astonishing for their maturity, spirituality, and wit. She later spoke of Mr. McLean as the magician who, in transforming my circumstances, gave me, perhaps, the energy to further transform myself. With university entrance under her belt, she tried nursing. Yes, less than a year later, she and the matron mutually agreed that, being a bit clumsy and slow, she wasn't really suited for the demands of ward work. So, not quite 17, alone and determined, she climbed on a bus and arrived in Auckland to enrol at the Auckland College of the University of New Zealand, from where she expected to graduate in three years with a BA in English and philosophy. <clears throat> she settled into her studies, giving her spare time not to friendships or riotous university life, but to reading voraciously. Auckland, however, required a foreign language for its BA, and try as she might, translation from English to French proved beyond her. Canterbury did not require a language and taught an interesting paper in the philosophy of religion, so her final year was spent in Christchurch, which she would come to call home. Around 19, Margaret made a decision which was to prove central 
to her identity and her dreams. Increasingly fascinated by myths, folk tales, classical philosophy, and above all, fantasy writing, she decided that it was in children's books with writers like Eleanor Fargin and C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien that fantasy had a true and acceptable maturity. She consciously determined to develop her talent as a writer for children. In 1955 New Zealand, there was next to no chance of a career as a writer of any sort. Margaret knew that she wasn't suited for nursing or secretarial work. Business careers for 19-year-old females barely existed. Teaching didn't appeal, and she had no money for travel. Her application to become a policewoman was politely and mercifully <laughs> declined. In desperation, she applied to library school and three years later began work at the Petoni Public Library. Her voluminous reading and secret of writing continued. Sometime in 1961, to help support herself and the child shortly to be born, she sent off three short stories to school publications. Penny arrived, as did a letter telling her that her story, The Procession, would be published in the school journal. She was immensely thrilled and felt vindicated, realizing that she could actually earn money from writing. The 1960s were to be no easy ride to literary fame. Margaret fully intended to look after her daughter, single-handed. She and Penny went to live with friends in the Ohario Valley, north of Wellington. In return for board, she did light housework and helped pick tomatoes. In 1965, she moved to Christchurch to begin slowly building a modest home in Governor's Bay. For some years, there were only two rooms, no running water, no electricity. The toilet was a movable long drop out in the garden. But in 1966, there had been two milestones, a second daughter, Bridget, and her first significant publication. The school journal editors had presciently decided to give over the entire issue to Mahi's poems and stories. The Wind Between the Stars and four others would later become internationally acclaimed picture books. On the downside, New Zealand publishers were producing between them only about 15 books a year and regularly rejecting Mahi submissions as being too European, insufficiently New Zealand. With Penny at school and Bridget about a year old, Margaret returned to full-time work. She would sustain her job at the school library service in Christchurch for the next 13 years, juggling motherhood with nine to five work and often writing until nearly dawn. Stories and poems only because that was all she could humanly do. Fellow librarians quite often saw Margaret spending her lunch hour fast asleep at her desk. But she was now in early 30s and had been honing her storytelling skills for more than 20 years. It was inevitable that if New Zealand's modest publishing for children in those days could not see the potential in a Mahi ma manuscript, then someone would, one day. The fairy godmother was a New York publisher, Helen Hoke Watts. Alerted by one of her editors that there was an absolutely perfect story called A Lion in the Meadow in a travelling exhibition of New Zealand school journals, Mrs Watts wrote to Margaret, who read the letter in disbelief, feeling, quote, like Cinderella coming into the ballroom and being seen at last in her true beauty. Mrs Watts sent Margaret an advance of $1,000 US, generous for those days, and booked an immediate flight to the ends of the earth where, my God, they didn't recognize American Express. In 1968, before Jumbos, this was an epic journey. She arrived with 13 pieces of luggage, requiring a second taxi and an additional room at the Governor's Bay hostelry. By the end of her stay, Mrs. Watts had read over 100 stories and offered Margaret a multi-book contract starting with five picture books to be launched simultaneously in London and New York, followed by several Mahi storybooks. It was a joyous moment for both. Now fame was starting to mark a knock on Margaret's door, great reviews and invitations to present speeches at conferences of all over the world. Some fortune followed. At Governor's Bay, Margaret installed running water and moved the toilet inside. She bought a second-hand car, between 1969 and her next big milestone in 1980, 
She had 35 picture books and story books published, mostly overseas, illustrated by some of the top artists in Europe and America. She didn't forget the school journal, and she started what would be a nearly 40-year commitment to visiting schools the length and breadth of New Zealand, often driving herself long, herself long distances all over the South Island and alighting from her car in a green, later multicoloured wig or a penguin suit. In 1976, Margaret accepted a New Zealand Literary Fund grant to take a year's leave of absence, providing a tantalising glimpse of life as a full-time writer. Afterwards, though, she went back to writing, to working, as children's librarian at the Canterbury Public Library for a further three years. It was not until 1980, with her responsibilities as a parent lessening, that she took the plunge into full-time writing. At 44, finally, she could work from home on the novels that she had long wanted to write. And now she had the support of Vanessa Hamilton, the English editor who was to become her agent and very close friend for the next 30 years. The results were electrifying. The Haunting and The Changeover, a supernatural romance, both won the publishing equivalent of Olympic gold, Britain's Carnegie Medal for the year's outstanding junior novel. Very few authors have won it twice. Margaret is the only one from outside Britain. The floodgates had now opened. From 1982, young adult, adult novels came regularly. The Catalogue of the Universe, The Tricksters, my personal favorite, Memory, The Other Side of Silence, award winners all in Britain and America, though not here, being published overseas, her books were then not eligible. There were shorter novels for younger readers, collections of short stories, many more picture books, television screenplays with Yvonne Mackay, and literally dozens of short school readers for educational programs for Shortland, Wendy Pye, and others. From 1969 through to this year, there is only one year in 1980, just at the time of transition from part to full-time writing, where she did not have at least one book published. Most years, there were from, from three to 10. 1986 alone saw 38 titles. Her children's TV series, Cuckoo Land and Strangers, won gold medals in New York film festivals. Even in the last decade of her life, she published two blockbusters, Madigan's Fantasia and The Magician of Hode, and in Kaitangata Twitch, her first novel and TV series to draw on Maori themes. Only a year ago, twice the age of many of the finalists, she scooped the pool of the New Zealand Post Awards with The Moon and Father, Farmer McPhee, superbly illustrated by David Elliott. Many of her works have gathered up multiple awards or mentioned on notable book lists. In this country, the Esther Glenn, the AIM and New Zealand Post Awards, the Storylines notable book lists. In America, the Horn Book and Boston Globe Awards. In Britain, the Observer and Guardian Awards. In Canada, she won the Phoenix Award three times for books, not winners at time of publication, but honored for their endurance 20 years later. Recognition of her genius was, from the late 1980s, transcending her purely literary achieve achievements. In 1993, she accepted the Order of New Zealand, our country's highest civil honor. It's widely believed that she more than once declined a title, but she happily gave her name to the country's top honor for services to children's literature, the Storylines Margaret Mahi Medal, awarded since 1991. Honorary doctorates have been confirmed on her by two universities, Canterbury and Waikato. In 1985, the New Zealand Literary Fund honoured her with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And in 2005, she won both the Prime Minister's Award for Fiction and the Icon Award given by the Arts Foundation. In 2006, there were two particularly fine events for Margaret. Her 70th birthday on the 21st of March was celebrated by Storylines in Auckland with a banquet attended by more than 300 people. It was certainly the literary event of the year. And in September of 2006, she traveled to Macau, 
to receive the world's most coveted award for children's literature, the Hans Christian Andersen Medal. <clears throat> In true fairy tale tradition, it was the Storylines Trust's third attempt. Back in 2000, New Zealand had been quietly persuaded to join IBI, the International Board on Books for Young People, so that Margaret could be nominated. The cost to the Trust was steep, over $3,000 a year membership. But the reward for Margaret herself and New Zealand is immeasurable. We knew that she had long been a member of the pantheon of world children's writers, now it was official. Her legacy of more than 250 titles will live triumphantly on. Margaret played many parts in her lifetime, author, storyteller, public speaker, essayist, commentator, friend, and mentor to countless writers. She insisted that her reading was as important to her as her writing, and her bookshelves contained, besides fiction, substantial works on religion, philosophy, history, politics, astronomy, biography. She was also, most of her adult life, a caregiver to her beloved children and grandchildren, her wider family, to neighbors, and a succession of treasured dogs. Among writers and friends, her generosity was legendary. For my 2005 literary portrait of Margaret, she allowed me access to her rather dusty files, over 30 years of essays, speeches, and press cuttings. Among many moments of discovery, one stood out for me. In a small forgotten booklet was Margaret's keynote address to a teacher's conference, Wellington, 1973. It was one of her very first major speeches, and she had ended it with a short poem. She was, remember, still quite young, only 37. Here's how she introduced it. When it comes to the end of a talk, I always like to contribute something of my own, a story or a poem. I couldn't think of any story that was appropriate, but on the way here, I wrote something down. It's written on a bag that has printed on it, please fold here after using. It was on the back of the seat in front of me on the aeroplane. <laughs> I don't know if this poem actually illustrates very lucidly what I have been talking about, except that in a general way, everything I write or do illustrates something. When I am old and wrinkled like a raisin, I will dance like a kite on the bucking back of the wind. I won't look ahead at the few bright days I am facing or look back at the years trailing out like streamers behind. Everyone else will be gone. The silence will seem to be mocking. But I will dangle and dance in the bright and clear air of the day, kicking my old stick legs in their red striped stockings, an old leaf wrinkled and brown, but golden and gay. Dance, dance, little old feet. Spin on your half penny of time. Roar, little old lion, in your meadow of gobwebs and rust till you burn with the fiery power of the dance and the rhyme and fall back to the earth in a sprinkle of golden dust. <laughs>